Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, live event. And a warm welcome also to all the ones that will be watching the recording of this event. So today I have the great pleasure to have with me Scott Dilemma, and uh, he will introduce himself in a moment. We will discover some more about a very interesting profile, the one of Scott, for to talk about business learning from hostage negotiations. But before we go into the topic and get to know our special guest of today, we want to know a bit more about our audience. So in particular, you know, do we have uh, some people come joining from the US, maybe that woke up early and got excited to start the day with Scott, or do we have European people that are maybe joining us soon after lunch and getting a, a small perspective on negotiation from this chat? So do leave us a message, maybe tell us uh, uh, from where you're connecting, or if you have any specific expectations, do let us know. This is your live event, and we want you to take the most of it, so do not hesitate to ask any question you may have, and we will have space for questions through our discussion. Of course, you know, I'm curious to discover some more about Scott and to hear about his profile, so uh, I have a few questions for him, but uh, you don't hesitate to also ask your own question because we are, of course, interested to discover some more about uh, our audience and what you may need. Okay, and as uh, our people start joining us, how about uh, uh, get it find out a bit more from uh, Scott? Scott, can you tell us a bit more about uh, your background, what you're doing, so that uh, uh, our audience can discover some more? Yeah, hello, good morning, good afternoon to all of you around the world. Um, again, my name is Scott Tillema. I am coming to you with a passion in negotiations. I have just completed a 20-year career as a police officer in the United States. I am based just outside of Chicago, right in the central United States. And in my work as a police officer, my specialty was crisis and hostage negotiations. I was trained by the FBI in 2007, and I've been involved in the field ever since. I worked as a hostage and crisis negotiator for one of the largest regional SWAT teams in the United States, covering a, millions of people in the Chicago area. And uh, also I worked as a detective and as a trainer within my own police department. Um, after 20 years of police work, I retired this January and I transitioned into uh, founding my own company with uh, my partner, Joanna Shea, the Negotiations Collective, where I do keynote speaking across the world and teaching and training all around negotiations, helping people get what they want and drawing from my experience as a police crisis and hostage negotiator. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. By the way, I don't know if you've seen it from our audience, but we have people from all over the world, even from Australia, you know, that are joining us in the middle of the night, making an effort for us. So thank you very much for all of you for being with us. And maybe, you know, I think, you know, since our audience is very much, you know, from other countries, you know, can you explain the role of hostage negotiator in American policing? Yeah, so the the phrase, the, the broad title of hostage negotiator um, kind of, in, in a lot of people's minds, think that everybody that has this title is, is all the same, doing the same type of work. But within the field, there's a variety of different specialties within. So really, it, it doesn't give us a lot of information specifically about what this person does. So in policing in America, we are called hostage negotiators. Sometimes we're called crisis negotiator crisis negotiators, which is probably a bit more accurate because within the U.S., even though there is a lot of guns and a lot of violence, hostage taking is a, a very rare situation that most people in police work um, don't deal with hostage taking very often. It just is not a common occurrence. But where we are used much more frequently is with one individual who is in crisis, who is experiencing significant emotion, who may be suicidal, or a person who might be armed and barricaded in a home, in a building, in an office, 
And that's where we have a hostage or crisis negotiator come in and we're having a conversation with a person. We're having a difficult conversation in a situation where it might be violent, where we could have a situation where we have weapons involved and we are trying to reach a peaceful surrender. We're trying to find a conclusion that is safe. And in a hostage taking, it's a person who has a weapon, who is threatening the safety of people involved, who is not letting them go. They're not free to leave. And in those situations, we have to figure out why this is occurring and bring our strategies to, again, free the hostages and reach a safe and peaceful conclusion. So in um, federal law enforcement, there is international hostage negotiations, there's kidnapping and ransom and, uh, and some of those fields. And that's a, a lot less of my involvement. What, what I'm doing more in my work or what I have done is much more of serving my community and the needs of what's happening in our communities and neighborhoods uh, in the area. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Scott, and I know that most of the people will uh, talk about the success and the kind of things that they've done well and this kind of, but uh, let me be a bit counterintuitive and let's do the reverse. I mean, maybe can you describe to us a failed negotiator? negotiation and what you learn from it. Yeah, uh, of course. And if there's any negotiators out there who are teaching, here's my great successes and I always win and, and my my strategy, my theory is always right and, and wins. You're talking with somebody who is not experienced because anybody who's done this work, whether it be in business or in crisis or in, in any situation, there are going to be outcomes that are not going to be good. And I've certainly had those situations and they've been um, deeply impactful on me. And the one that comes to mind was we were having a negotiation with a man who was holding a gun to his head. And usually we do our communication by telephone, which is obviously uh, very safe for us to do. But in this particular situation, we were negotiating face to face. And I was one of those negotiators who was talking with this individual. And in my period of time talking with him, truly, I, I was talking with him for hours. So many people think that these conversations go very quickly. It always fits into a Hollywood movie and it's done. This went on for a very long time. And our thought is, if it goes on for a period of time, we're going to get a good outcome just simply because there's a reason that this bad thing hasn't happened yet. And we're going to explore what that was. And I remember um, thinking that this man was probably going to be going to jail. So I had a different strategy in my mind. I know people don't like to go to jail. I've taken a lot of people to jail. I've closed that door and nobody's really happy to be there. So I had a different strategy in my mind. I thought maybe I can identify and say, I can see you're having a bad day. I can see that you're in crisis. Times are tough right now. And I tried to convince him, let's go to the hospital instead. Let me take you there. Instead of maybe an ambulance, I could drive you. We could discreetly get you there. If your concern is about money and it's going to be expensive, which it is here in the U.S., maybe we can find ways to pay for that and help you um, through that process and make it a little bit easier. But the problem that I had, and either he told me this and I forgot, or I never asked this and I was too busy trying to sell, um, was that he was just released from the hospital a few days earlier. And for all of the listeners in the audience right now, I know that there's some of you who have been in the hospital as a patient, and I never have. So you know something that I don't know, that being a patient in a hospital is a terrible thing that it's, it's no more fun than jail, probably. You don't want to be there. The food's not good. And here I am trying to convince him that we should go to the hospital. And it was a failed strategy. And he didn't want to go. And he was very resistant to that. And it was not a, a line of conversation that he was taking in. And without getting into the details, this was a failed negotiation. Um, he didn't put the gun down. And in the end, he pulled the trigger. And that's very, very hard because now for years and years, I have to reflect on this negotiation and I have to think, was there something I could have done? Was there something I could have said um, 
maybe a, a little bit differently, maybe at a different time that could have gotten us to a better outcome. And there are learnings that come from this. And first of all, preparation is, is so critical when you go into these things, because we know that there are going to be outcomes that we don't get in business. Maybe you don't get the contract, you don't get the sale, things don't work out. And I don't ever want that to be because I wasn't prepared. I am going to be completely ready. And when there are outcomes that don't go the way we want, we have to accept that sometimes it's because they're beyond our control. The other person, the other team, the other company, they're still in charge of their own decisions. And regardless of whether we make a, a good presentation, a great presentation, whatever it might be, the outcome still requires both parties to come together. And that's what I try to explain. Negotiation, it's reaching an agreement. I'm not trying to convince you that I'm right. It's not about my ego, but can we find an agreement? So that's one that I look back and say, I really wish it had gone differently. Um, I would really wish for a good outcome. Um, but in each situation we learn, from even the failed negotiations. Okay, so there are there are a few points you know that you made that uh, resonate with me. First, you know, of course, you know, you make a very strong point about the importance of preparation. You know, and I do see some of my uh, workshop participants in the audience. Uh, hello. Alisa, Maria Giovanna, Isabella, whatever. But uh, I wanna, I wanna. Uh, you know, you know, we, we we always talk about preparation being important when you're in a business negotiation. But then, you know, in a business negotiation, maybe you may end up getting, you know, hundred thousand more or less, whether you're well prepared or not. In your cases, the life of people. So, you know, in the case, you know, if you have well prepared or not, you know, may make a difference about uh, solving uh, a crisis situation or ended up with. Uh, a fatal situation like the one that you, you just described. Mm -hmm. There is another element that I would like to touch. In You mentioned, uh, I don't know if he told me that he was in hospital and I didn't listen or if I never asked the question. So, you know, you touch on uh, two critical skills in negotiation, listening and questioning. So recognizing that, uh, you know, Listening, so by the way, uh, you know, I just make a small point. We tend to overestimate our listening skills, right? Um, and I see it all the time when we do video role play, right? You know, I, I watch the people do the video, then uh, I make a remark, for instance, one of the students, listen, you know, the other party told you that, etc. And uh, they say, no. And then, you know, we watched the video and of course, you know, there was some information that came from the counterpart, but since, you know, we are so focused in preparing our own reply, then we ended up, you know, not getting the, the message from, uh, from, uh, from other people. So, I mean, uh, for you, this thing is such a critical skills. Uh, how do you work it? You know, what are the kind of uh, advice that you can give to our audience that can help them move their uh, listening skills to the next level? Right. And I think the biggest one is you have to practice under pressure. You have to find a way to generate that pressure. Because I remember in my first negotiation, the first time that I was the person on the phone, um, we came into what we believe this is a, a hostage taking. So this is a serious situation. And I remember just trying to go through all the different strategies and the techniques that we were trained. And it was very different because when we're relaxed, we're on the couch, we can think creatively, we can hear each other, we take it in. But when it matters, you don't realize that you feel that pressure, you feel the weight on your shoulders. So the first time I remember doing this was when we were in, in this FBI class. It was a week-long class. And I think on the second day, they had us, uh, they, they taught us the eight skills of active listening. So no, now we know it cognitively. Now we have to put it into practice. So what they had us do is we would sit back to back on the chair so we can't see each other. And they were going to have us do listening exercises. And I remember thinking, I'm, I'm an adult. I'm a professional. I know how to listen. This seems a little bit basic. 
but they would have the rest of the class gather around and watch us. And now all of a sudden you feel this, this pressure to perform that I don't want to be the one that fails or makes a mistake in front of all my peers. So it was a really good creative way to generate a little bit of that pressure to say, people are watching. This is important. I need to do that. So not only think it through, but actually practice it and, and create pressure. And one of the ways that's easy to do is record yourself. So turn on the video. Nobody is a bigger critic of you than you, because all of a sudden you realize all the mannerisms, all these things that I'm doing when I get nervous, how do I manage myself as I'm taking in this information? How well do I do? But knowing the eight skills of active listening is really helpful. Uh, having these different strategies so we don't just go back to the same listening technique over and over. Um, preparing a list of questions in advance is really helpful to me because I find that when people are under pressure, I'll do exercises with law enforcement. We'll do scenarios where they actually have to practice and listen. And I'll jump out and I've got a knife to my throat and I'll tell them I'm having a bad day. I'm really having a bad day. And I want to put them under pressure. And I find that their ability to ask questions become very, very limited that we teach open-ended questions. We want to engage somebody. We want to have a dialogue. And that's really tough when they're under pressure. And we see just yes or no questions over and over and over. So coming in, if I've got a piece of paper and I can write out, here's 12 good questions or even six good questions that I can offer at any time that is going to create a dialogue and bring this person into the conversation for me, that's going to be really, really helpful. So when I get stuck, I can use one of these questions or use one of these listening techniques and have it seem very natural. Okay, great. So, you know, yes, we may behave differently when we are relaxed than versus first we are oh. when we are under pressure. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Now, you mentioned the eight skill of active listening. I mean, in, in the business world, which of these eight skill is the one that uh, you believe uh, people tend to underestimate, people do not apply in, uh, in, a, in an effective way? Yeah, so I have learned in doing these negotiations uh, where I come from that emotion is the driver of behavior, that everything is emotionally driven. I can't think of a single negotiation where somebody comes in and it's all logic and reason. Now, there are purposeful hostage takings where somebody comes in with, with a, a purpose and they have demands. So I know they exist, but I've never been part of one of those. Every single one, whether it's a crisis negotiation or an expressive emotional hostage taking, it's all fueled by emotion. So I, I did that work and, and studied to try to figure out, are we emotional creatures or are we logic and reasoning and very thoughtful oriented creatures? And uh, the researchers, the professors at Harvard say that 95% of our decisions are in the subconscious driven by emotion. Um, Chicago Booth, one of the top business schools, says 90% of our decisions are driven by emotion. So one of the active listening skills is emotion labeling to connect with the emotion that people are feeling. So my thought is, if we experience this so much in crisis negotiation, in the business world, are people completely void of emotion? Are they not experiencing emotion in these negotiations? And now as an entrepreneur, as someone who is functioning in the business world, I see that emotions play a big factor because I'm negotiating all the time in my business, whether it be the, the new person that we're hiring right now or in a, a contract to be a keynote speaker or to do some training. There's emotions involved in all sides. So be emotionally available in these communications, in these negotiations. And instead of trying to connect with the content of what somebody is saying, are we willing to identify that emotion and label that emotion to say, you know what, you sound very excited about this, or I sense you're a bit disappointed with this offer or with this conversation. And as we are able to better connect with how people are experiencing their emotions, 
I think that we have a, a better connection and a deeper bond. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Do you s experience more emotion? Is there a lot of emotion in the business world or is this something that's completely set aside? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Now, Scott, uh, interesting because we just did a debate on Monday, you know, and uh, one of the workshop participants is still attending uh, this LinkedIn Live. And we had a discussion because we were talking about active listening, then empathic listening, what you call emotional labeling, right? You know, go in search of the emotion. And some of the participants said, but, you know, I feel intrusive if you tell to people that, you know, that they are sad or whatever, you know, it may not be the right things in the business world. And, uh, um, and by the way, I was mentioning, I know that you were at IMD last week, and when I was mm -hmm. doing a workshop at IMD myself, I, I met a, a very senior executive, you know, from a, a very large American multinational, you no know, former president, actually, of uh, one of the regions, that he said, oh, no, you know, the business is about rational things. The business is about rational things, and uh, that's what should be the focus. And by the way, I worked with this company myself uh, at the beginning of my career, and it is a company which uh, has uh, a lots of procedures, very strict rules. You know, remember that uh, as a procurement guy, I had to write uh, the recommendation to justify why I was chosen my supplier, my boss, and the boss of my boss had to approve it. So sometimes company try to put uh, a lot of rules and regulation to try to minimize the scope from emotion. But inevitably, emotion creep in. Emotion creep in. One of my former boss said, with things being equal, 99% of the times we do business with people that we like. And with things being unequal, still 99% of the times we do business with people that we like. <laughs> so I think that's yes, terrific. The, the, I think you know the, the emotional side is there in business, and my message to to to, to the participant of the training is that uh, indeed uh, you know if you want to create bonding with the people, uh, then uh, yes, go after the emotion even in the business world, and this is going to help. Thank you, Carmen Hanna, for. Uh, yeah, mentioning indeed just at the part of our training, yes. <laughs> it was it was an interesting debate. And, you know, of course, you know, people do have different views and also depending on the culture, right? You know, right. Uh, if you go to Japan, having uh, an emotional type of discussion is much more difficult, right? You know, and uh, um, the, the culture there is that uh, if you lose your emotion, then you're a weak, you're a weak, you're a loser. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you always remain under control. You never display your emotion. And that's something that uh, is part of the culture. While, of course, you know, maybe Latin America and the Middle East, then, uh, you know, the, the emotional uh, display is, is much bigger. So uh, good discussion, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to take all the stage. And uh, <clears throat> let's open up... Uh, for uh, one of the questions. By the way, this is your live event. So, you know, do not hesitate to ask a question because, you know, we all uh, wanna uh, get the most from uh, having Scott with us. Scott, have you ever found yourself in a crisis negotiation with teenagers, like in school shooting, for example? How is that different than interacting with adults? Yeah, there's, there's a lot here. Um, so have I done uh, negotiation with teenagers? Yes. So one of the things that I have done is um, I volunteered on a uh, what we call the crisis text line. And I know that at least in the Americas, it's known um, 741741 is a number that you can text um, and then be connected with a crisis counselor. And I went through the training and volunteered as a crisis counselor. And most, if not all, of the textures on there were teenagers. And um, I, I don't think that they're really all that much different in, in crisis than adults who are in crisis because there's a, a lot of emotion there. Um, but it's the scope of the problems that are sometimes different, that um, teenagers don't yet have the perspective that adults have. So sometimes, you know, I'll have a, a little chuckle to myself of the concern or the crisis that they're in, um, because adults see this as as very minor or almost irrelevant. But it requires some discipline to say, 
to them, this is very important. I can't come in and say, well, this doesn't matter or it's not that important because to them in the moment, this is everything. So they, they lack a little bit of the perspective that as adults, we can say, all right, in, in the big picture, this is a really minor thing. So having perspective is really important. And that's why I think it's, it's always great working with negotiators who have real experience, who can share real stories to say, you know, this isn't a, a big deal or this could be a big deal. Um, but with the example of school shootings, um, working in law enforcement, um, we prepare for this type of thing for, for school shootings. And when you have an active shooter at a school or a business, um, this is not time to negotiate. This is time to act and we need to stop the threat. Um, truly, if there is a situation where everything is safe and we have the ability without raising the level of danger to somebody else, negotiating is always an option to be considered. But at the point that there is immediate danger and the bullets are flying, we're, we're done talking. Now it's time to act. Um, so hopefully in, in the rest of the world, the, the school shootings and the active shooter is not as much of a concern. But what is happening there in nearly all of these situations is you have someone who feels that they haven't been listened to. They want to be heard, that this is an expression of emotion, and that oftentimes these people are unbonded. So what's happening in the psychology here is that it's, it's that lack of connection. And when I come in and I have these conversations in crisis negotiation is we are developing a bond and we are developing a connection. And oftentimes people at this level of crisis are unbonded and oftentimes have trouble bonding and have trouble communicating. And I want to bring a, a high level of that uh, to them and, and hopefully steer them in a positive direction. Yeah, great. By the way, there is a, a point from Scott that uh, what a great, great question. By the way, Isabella, thank you. And uh, there was a, there is a point that I want to highlight: the fact that you know, to us, you know, maybe what the teenager may go through looks small, and for them is everything. And you have to go into seeing the world as they see it. And right. uh, in fact, you know, perspective taking is uh, in negotiation even more effective than emotional intelligence in the sense that sometimes when you are very highly emotional intelligence you may have a tendency to feel too empathic too much sympathy for the other party and then you may not dare to do what is needed in terms of being a good negotiator perspective taking is the skill that really helps you. So, you know, you know, being able, you know, to look at the world from the perspective of the other party, what I call in my training dual vision, is something that certainly helps, you know, I, in negotiation also in the business life. So thank you, Scott, for highlighting this. By the way, in one of your previous intervention, you talked about the behavioral change staircase. I mean, could you explain what the behavioral change staircase is and share your thought on that? Yeah, so the behavioral change staircase, this was a model created by Gary Nesner, the first chief negotiator of the FBI, maybe 30 years ago. And it's got five different stairs. And his idea was we go through this process and that's how we begin to how we get to the end. And it begins with active listening and empathy, rapport, influence and behavioral change. These are the five stairs going from the bottom to the top. And I think that each one of these concepts is, is good, it's correct. This is the gold standard for police crisis and hostage negotiators in the United States. I would think that every negotiator who's been through the training, whether or not they still remember those five steps or not might be different, but each one of them was trained in this model. It's just the, the most widely accepted model that's out there. And uh, I, I think that this is all good and valid, but I was, I was trained by the FBI and I still teach for the FBI, even in retirement, I, I teach as part of their week-long class. So I'm careful not to be too critical, but I just see it a little bit differently because having studied behavioral economics, I know that what we see is all there is. The power of vision is very, very important. So the model that I teach, instead of a stairway, is a circle. And I think that that visual is important because we're 
as as negotiators, you get a lot of the type A personalities, a lot of the let's get it done, let's get it done right now. And I'm one of these people who are impatient. I am notorious for being impatient. I just want to get things done very efficient. Let's move on. And when I show somebody you're at the bottom stair and your goal is to get to the top stair, we just run up to the top. And if you're an athlete, maybe you'll skip a couple stairs going right to the top. And when we do these scenarios and exercises, so often people go right to behavioral change. They're try put the knife down, drop the gun, let those people go. And they're just trying to get that top piece right there. And I had a great opportunity just two months ago to um, uh, keynote with uh, Gary Nesner in Prague at a global negotiation conference, NegotiCon. And him and I got to spend a few days together and we talked about this. And he talked about the, the top level is not so much behavioral change. He sees it as cooperation. And I was like, well, I like this, that we cooperate. But I I want to teach it as a, a circle. And we're going around the circle. And for me, the circle represents the bond that we are creating. And around that, the principles are, are largely the same. We're working to understand. Um, we're considering the timing of when to deliver the message, thinking about not what you say, but how you say it, the delivery piece and knowing the power of respect. So in, in the model that I teach, we go around and we touch on each one of these four principles. And I trust that um, 30 years ago when, when Gary and the FBI is teaching the active listening skills, I think what they mean more broadly is to work to understand what the situation is because communication has changed now. I mean, look what we're doing right now and how in the last couple of years, it's very common for people to have Zoom calls and video chats, whereas five years ago, we weren't doing this. There was This wasn't as common. So our communication is changing. Active listening skills is not enough anymore. If you're doing a great job doing the active listening skills, but what I see is very, very different. If the body language, I don't care. I'm not paying attention. I'm checking my watch. I'm on my cell phone doing all this. You're not going to believe that I care about you. You're not going to feel that there's a connection. So in addition to active listening, we have to bring in the nonverbals, not only controlling my own nonverbals, but I'm reading yours now. So what is your body language? What are your gestures? What are the facial expressions? What are what what is this smirk, the contempt, the surprise? All these things that we can see is giving us information. And our power in negotiation is going to come from information and options. And if I'm missing all this information, I'm not going to be effective as a negotiator. So when I teach this, I say, we need to go beyond active listening. This is no more good enough because everything is not done by telephone. We can see each other. We can experience each other. So in addition to active listening, we have to work to understand the nonverbals, the gestures, all this information, including what we're wearing. Because as a negotiator on the SWAT team, I'm wearing the same SWAT gear as everybody else. And sometimes that doesn't look very friendly to be having a conversation with somebody in that green military type outfit. I would much rather have somebody in a, in a comfortable shirt that I can connect with them. So things have changed over the last few years. And I think that when I teach this, I try to bring in some of that. And uh, I hope that the, uh, the FBI who is teaching these things really considers some of those changes as we move forward, because we're missing some important pieces to be an effective negotiator in 2023. Yeah. Now, uh, let me build on a couple of your points. You know, one of the ideas that I like about the change, you know, from staircase to a circle is to say, okay, I'm doing all the steps, you know, active listening, building rapport, et cetera, et cetera. Then, you know, if I realize that I'm not there, maybe, you know, I should restart again. Okay, like, let me see, okay, maybe I should be doing more active listening, more building rapport, et cetera. And then, you know, this uh, is going to help me, you know, to be more successful in the future. And uh, the other idea that uh, your, your comments bring me back, you know, beginning of my career, the patience element, right? You know, um, I remember uh, uh, that uh, I was trying to do something which was completely new in our industry. It was an industry where you were doing a price negotiation on a monthly basis. So the, the very volatile market and uh, we were negotiating price on a monthly basis. And I was uh, setting up with my suppliers long-term agreement. 
and of course this sounded very scary because uh, you have the comfort of the monthly negotiation that you adapt to the market once you have uh, a long-term agreement you may be substantially off versus the market in one way or the other and it doesn't feel comfortable so you know me as a young ambitious guy i wanted to drive the other party you know to 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 come to a conclusion but uh, you know what you say yeah well it takes patience you know we have to work on ourselves and uh, it takes patience maybe i should have done more to say how can i help uh, my counterpart to sell the deal internally you know mm -hmm. how will uh, their victory speech look like and so that uh, i'm going to make it easier for uh, the sales director to sell the deal to the sales vice president to the head of the business unit that uh, will make it look uh, this agreement as a success and uh, you know that's the kind of things that uh, yeah you, you experience so you fail and then you know you try to take corrective actions it's so important. People think I just negotiate for me. I teach people I don't negotiate for me. I negotiate for we because there are people who are impacted by your decisions within this negotiation. And let's not forget that this person, even in a crisis negotiation when there's only one person, they're going to have to turn around at some point and explain to their family and friends what they did and why they did that. And how do we help them save face? How do we help them explain and believe that this is an acceptable agreement for them? Yeah. Just, you know, there are plenty of questions. Just a moment to tell you that if you're interested to sharpen your negotiation skills, we do have an event coming up. You know, indeed, you know, of course, you know, more questions, you can start writing down your question if you want. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you that on the 27 and 28th of June, we have a strategic negotiation masterclass that I'm running with Oxford professor Owen Derbyshire. He's the academic director of the Oxford program on negotiation. The workshop takes place at Geneva Airport, so it's easily reachable by plane and by uh, train. So if you want to move your negotiation skills to the next level and Geneva is not too far away from you, then how about joining us and have a couple of fun days to move negotiation to the next level to learn how to deal with more complicated type of situation maybe what i'm going to put also in the chat is also a link to our uh, uh, linkedin page you know uh, we do have uh, conti advanced business learning that's the cabl that you see on the top right corner is uh, the name of my company so it would be great if you could take a moment now click on the link that you find and sign up it takes uh, 10 seconds sign up to our uh, linkedin page so that you can stay updated with our events and the kind of things that we can do to help you out okay now uh end of the advertising moment but let's uh, get uh, there are a couple of interesting questions let's start with the first one in business we usually need to maintain the relationship after the deal does that not count at all in your negotiations i think relationships are important um there are some negotiators out there who are going to be held hostage to the idea of maintaining the relationship. And I think sometimes that's a problem for them, that they're the accommodator, they're the pleaser, and it's always about keeping the other side happy. At, at some point, you need to be tough and you need to stand up for yourself and, and make some demands and, and get what you want. But after the, the negotiation, after the deal, there has to be an implementation of the deal that um, we, we teach autonomy triggers, that people especially now, especially after the pandemic, we feel the need to be free and make our own decisions because there's a period of time that we didn't, we weren't as free as we were used to. So are people experiencing the freedom and autonomy within that negotiation? And the reason that this is important is because I need to choose the outcome that I want. Because if you're in a position of power over me, you can force me to say yes. You can, if, if you're my boss, you can make me agree to whatever the agreement is and agree to the deal. But now I have to make it happen. I have to provide the service. I have to provide the product. I have to get things done and meet the deadlines. And if somebody's forced into 
saying yes and forced into agreement, they're not going to do it with all their heart. They're not going to put their best effort into it. So making sure that we have people who are freely entering into these agreements to say yes, because I choose to, yes, because I want to. And it's not over when we sign the contract. This is now the beginning of that process to then make it happen. And I think in the process of implementing the deal is also the exploration for the next deal, because I might not be completely transparent. I may not be completely trusting if you are a new negotiation partner for me. But as we continue to make this happen, we're starting to learn about each other and we're starting to explore. And this is where the great negotiators are finding the value to say, okay, if we expanded our partnership, could we find greater things working together? I can identify some needs. It seems like you may need marketing or advertising or shipping or wherever these needs might be. And I might be able to deliver that to you. So we don't walk away and say the deal is done. The contract is signed. I think that's really the beginning of a new phase. First of all, let's implement the deal that we agreed. And second, can we start exploring to find out where is there more value now that we're starting to like each other and starting to trust each other and starting to be more open? I think that the relationship is is really almost just beginning. And it's important that not only at the time up to the deal, but throughout the implementation that we're working together to build that relationship to say, can we succeed even more through this continued partnership? Thank you, Scott. Let's take one more question from Alisa. Do you notice any difference between negotiating with men and women? Yes, of course. Uh, I found in my world, men are much more violent. And I think that the research is there and the, and the statistics are there. Um, and, and to maybe notch it down from violence, maybe aggressive might be the word that we can use in the, uh, in the business setting that men tend to be more aggressive, but I don't want to label this broadly because sometimes we fall back to the label that we're given. So we have to be very, very careful when we're labeling groups of people, because there are people within those groups that say, that's not me, that's not how I function. And, and that can be triggering to, to someone's identity. Um, but certainly generally there are differences and there have been negotiations where we have chosen our negotiators based on gender. You know, for example, there was a man who took a woman hostage and he was really angry with her and there was a lot of emotion. He had shot a police officer who was coming in to try to rescue her. So this is somebody who displayed incredible violence. And we were very, very concerned that this woman was going to be killed by this man. And we chose a negotiator, the primary negotiator based on gender. Because the thought was, here's somebody who is very, very uh, full of ego, someone who is very aggressive, very, very controlling. And if we bring a man on the phone, are we concerned that this person is going to try to show dominance to show, hey, you're not going to control me? And instead, we, we brought in uh, a female negotiator. And that was very successful, that there was um, a, an element where he was connecting with her and and we heard he was so upset in fact during the negotiation he was vomiting because he wasn't able to control his body there was that much emotion and she says to him you know let's do the let's do some breathing exercises and that is really unusual to say to someone who's holding a woman hostage let's do some breathing exercises together and he jumps at it and says yes let's do this so she's almost leading him through this negotiation by allowing him to feel that he's in control. And that's nothing that I think a male negotiator could have ever pulled off with him because he would have been so busy asserting his dominance for his particular psychology. So there are um, some differences in the negotiators themselves and, and negotiating with them. But I think that as soon as we come in with a prejudice to say, I'm negotiating with a woman, therefore she's going to be emotional and soft and passive. I am going to get ripped because this woman could be assertive and aggressive and a great listener. So let's be careful with our prejudice. Let's be careful with our biases and stereotypes and really come in with that blank slate and that open mind because people of both genders are really, really talented 
And uh, I wouldn't want to put myself at a disadvantage by coming in and saying, well, this th it's a man, so he's going to be impatient and aggressive, and we're going to be able to get what I want because here's all his shortcomings. Not the case. Let's have that open mind. Yeah. And I think you know, it's important to make the difference between stereotypes and prototypes. Stereotypes is the kind of negative kind of things. Yo, know, the woman are always like this. She's going to be emotional or the Italians are always late or whatever, any kind of things, which is uh, as a negative spin uh, and uh, it takes uh, uh, rules. Prototypes is the idea is on average, the women are better listener than male, or they are better at reading body language, whatever. On average, uh, the Brazilian tend to have a lower waiting times, and the Japanese tend to have a longer waiting times before they reply. But this is again, you know, this is an average, a prototype, but then it doesn't apply to all the Brazilian, to all the Japanese, to all the men or the women. So I guess, you know, that's uh, an important distinction to make. Thank you. I, you know, our time flies. So, Scott, you know, let's take, uh, you know, there are uh, uh, a very quick one. And uh, the color red does a significant influence on negotiation. Is this true? I have no idea. I'm probably the <laughs> wrong person to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's take the next one then. Could you share your toughest negotiation and your learning from it? I mean, we already talked about a failed negotiation before. Now, is there uh, another one that comes into your mind that was tough? Yeah, there's every negotiation is tough. When somebody could be hurt or killed, there is no such thing as an easy negotiation. That's why I love functioning in the business world that we're, we're haggling over a little bit of money on a contract. That's easy. Let's, let's enjoy that and have fun because there aren't those big consequences. But... Um, I think bonding is central to my belief to be an effective negotiator, at least in my crisis negotiation world. And my first negotiation is when I really experienced this. And they teach you this in the class, that you have to connect and you have to do this. But until you experience this success, it's very, very different. So I, I like Simon Sinek, who says, start with why, and that's important, but let's start with when. When was that time that you remember? Because those are the critical moments. So the learning, um, it, it was a, a, a situation where a, a domestic disturbance, so a man and woman in an apartment, and the neighbors were calling police because they could hear violence inside. And when the police got to the door, they could hear a woman calling for help. Help me, help me. They, they could hear um, the sound of a gun and, and some duct tape. So they called for the SWAT team. And um, I was a young negotiator. I had never led a negotiation before. I was new on the team. So when I was driving there that morning, I wasn't too worried that I was going to be the person talking on the phone. But all of a sudden, I'm the negotiator on the phone with a man who could bring violence against this woman, against the police officers, against me. And I started thinking, okay, how am I going to do this? And at first, you know, he was giving me no. I, I was afraid of the word no. I thought that would be the end. I thought that was a failure when we hear no. But really, this is the beginning. No is the beginning of a new conversation. So one of the biggest learnings is don't be afraid of the word no. We expect the word no. We anticipate the word no. And now that we know it's coming, now we can begin. And now we get into the listening, the non-judgmental listening. The My goal was not to free the hostage. My goal was to create a bond and create a dialogue. And with that little mindset shift, everything is different. Because if my goal is to free the hostage, I'm going to come in and say, let her go, let her go, please let her go. I order you to let her go. None of these things are going to work. Get the mindset right. My goal is to form a connection. And once I get that mindset, now I can learn about him and ask him, what are your concerns? And he starts to open up and he tells me, you know what? I'm scared too. You know, I don't want to say to him, this is my first negotiation and I'm really, really anxious and, and worried. But he's saying, you know what? I'm afraid too. I can see the SWAT team is here. I can see all the police and the guns. So he's now experiencing and sharing some of that emotion. And as we start that dialogue, that dialogue is so important in negotiations. And some people teach, come in, make demands, say this, this, and this. Don't listen. Don't worry about the other side. This connection is where it matters. We don't have influence if we don't have connection. 
and it takes time. And that was the other learning. I'm impatient. I think it's going to go just like this because I said to do it or I asked to do it. That's not the case. He's in control of that. I am not. So how do we form that bond? How do we connect? And by being a patient listener, we start to have that connection. By being curious, we start to have that connection. By not being judgmental, we start to have that connection. And if we focus on building that bond and connection, then we get influence. And in the end of that conversation, he let her go. He, he surrendered himself and it was a peaceful outcome. And I remember the one of the commanders, one of the he he's a chief of police. He came back into the negotiations room and and he found out who was on the phone and he gave me the thumbs up and he said aces. Just that one word, that positive reinforcement, aces. And I was like, how do we do this? We did this. I had no idea if that conversation was 10 minutes or 10 hours. You're so focused in it. And that's really where you need to be. Stay focused on what matters most, what's important now. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, listen, there are another couple of questions. These are the last two that we are taking because uh, I, I know that we could uh, stay with Scott forever, but uh, probably some of you have a meeting coming we're, up. We're going to so... spend the whole day on LinkedIn. <laughs> here, so we're this okay, whole, let's, uh, let's listen to Hedy. <laughs> How to run a hostage negotiation when having a language barrier? Language is important. Language is really, really important. And sometimes I'm asked to do... Um, lectures and training in different languages where we're going to have interpreters um, exchanging that language, translating that language. And for me, that's a real problem because in, in language, what we say is important and you're just translating that content, but you lose how you say it. And the delivery of the message is everything. And some people challenge me on this, say, well, that's really not important. I say it's critically important, not only how you say it, but what is your, your means of communication? Is it different on text message versus email, phone call, Zoom, video chat, in person? All of the delivery aspects are really, really critical. And for me, the delivery, each word we say matters. And it's when there's people's lives in the balance when it there there's safety of others involved no detail is too small that we shouldn't be addressing it so in the delivery i'm considering the rate the rhythm the pressure the volume and the tone of what i'm saying not only am i thinking about the content but each one of those five aspects of a perfect delivery have to be considered and it's so important that in a negotiation where if I'm the primary negotiator, I have, I have someone just like you sitting across from me as my coach, as the secondary negotiator. And one of your primary jobs is to manage me, to make sure that I am delivering this exactly correctly. What you see in Hollywood and on the movies is not right. Denzel Washington with the cell phone trotting up and down the street. It doesn't happen like that that my delivery is so critical that I have someone coaching me in real time throughout that negotiation to make sure that I'm nice and smooth and just perfect. So when we have a translator involved, we lose all of that because the translator is trying to keep up and getting the words just right. And sometimes the exact correct word that I want to use might not exist in that other language, or it might be missed in that translation. So when we're doing a cross-cultural conversation, I mean, even just make it a conversation, we need to slow down. We need to have the, the paraphrasing and the summarizing to important skills and active listening that I wouldn't say are most important in my day-to-day -day conversations. But if it's cross-cultural, I'm going to move that right to the top to say, let's paraphrase and let's summarize routinely to make sure that what you're saying is what I'm hearing. And what I'm saying is what you are hearing because that one word, if we miss that in a hostage negotiation could have significantly negative outcomes. So language is so important. And if I can get someone who is a native speaker of the language that we're communicating with, that is much more important to me than having a trained negotiator. I would want someone who can communicate very, very easily in that language. That would be a higher priority for me. Yeah. 
let's make a, a quick example, right? You know, about the importance of the delivery. Let's take a, a sentence, you know, Scott, what are you doing here, right? You know, that's the sentence, Scott, what are you doing here? Now, I can say, Scott, what are you doing here? Or I can say, Scott, what are you doing here? You know, the words are the same, but uh, depending on the tone of voice, how it's delivered, then he has two completely different meaning. And right. uh, uh, then, you know, the problem is when you have a translator is that uh, a sentence may be misinterpreted and uh, you may give it, uh, you know, it may be perceived in the wrong way just because maybe the translator was in a hurry to cop up and deliver it in a way which didn't reflect, you know, the original tone of voice. Yeah. Right. If, if we began this conversation and you said, Scott, what are you doing here? I would look around and be like, am, am I not the invited guest? Should I be somewhere <laughs> else? Right? <laughs> okay. Here we have the last question from the audience. I like the idea that the goal is to form a connection versus freeing the hostage. I assume this applies in the business world as well. Looking to form a connection versus price down? I think that it's more difficult for people to be tough on people that they like. And, and think about this for, for the audience. Think in your own life. People who you have a, a good relationship for your friends, your family, your business associates, is it easy for you to be really tough on them? And sometimes it's not. And, and sometimes uh, it's, it's challenging for us to um, say no. When somebody in my inner circle asks me for something, the answer is yes. You know, how can I be of service to you? And, and that could be going to get you a cup of coffee. It could be something more significant. We're more inclined to say yes. So I think that at some level, there's a tactical benefit of being likable, uh, of being genuine and sincere and nice and building that relationship that when you then ask, um, I would, I, I'm going to need a reduction on price. Chances are maybe you, you're going to have a better chance to get it. So for me, it's not either, or it's not get a connection or get a price drop. I think that you can do both to say, Hey, I'm, I'm asking for this. And when you are likable and nice, it's tough to say no. And when someone is being a jerk to you, you can't wait to say no. And, and they're being tough and they're, and they're being rude. You can, be, I, I train people to be tough negotiators and be really nice. I'm going to be really tough and I'm going to give you a smile and be likable. And there's groups out there that say you're going to be a jerk and, and you're not going to have a relationship. I can't wait to say no to you. If you're going to be a jerk to me, if you're not going to give me some recognition, recognition, validation, appreciation, I don't feel these positive feelings toward you. Now it's going to be easy to be a jerk and, and I'm not going to want to do the deal with you and I'm going to be exploring other options and I'm not going to have to deal with you. And the first opportunity to get out of that, I'm going to do it. So I think that it's okay to be kind. It's okay to be tough. You need to be both and don't ever um, compromise what you want and what you need because you're trying to be nice or trying to be an accommodator within the negotiation. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, uh... We also say, you know, an iron fist in a velvet glove, right? You know, so that uh, you are nice, but at the same time, you defend your interests. You're able to both, you know, build a relationship and uh, create and claim a fair share of value. Now, to conclude this discussion in going back to the original title, Business Learning from Hostage Negotiation. So what are three key learning from your hostage negotiation activity that may be relevant for the business world? Yeah. So number one, manage yourself first. I don't care if this is business or hostage or academics, manage yourself first. When you're coming into a negotiation, you are working with another person. If I could just go and get the outcome that I want by myself, I would go do it. I wouldn't need you. And we're so busy trying to control the other person and get them to do what we want. We forget control ourselves first. Once I'm in a good managed state, I'm aware of what my triggers are. I know the things that you can do and say that's going to make me emotional or set me off my solid base. I'm going to be stronger once I'm aware of all this and I control myself. So number one, manage yourself first. Number two, 
be a great listener. We've talked about this a little bit, but I came into negotiations and I wanted to know what is the magic phrase? What is the one thing I can say that's going to get an outcome that is going to make everybody say yes? And there's no such thing. It's being a listener, taking in that information, connecting with that person. So number one, manage yourself first. Number two, be a great listener. And I think we we touched on this um, a little bit earlier is mastering the delivery that you can say all the right content. You can say it at the right time, but if you're saying it with a tone or in a way that is uncomfortable for your negotiation partner, they're going to feel uncomfortable. I want you to be comfortable with me. I want you to spend time and I want you to open up and the more comfortable I can get you in this negotiation, the more you are going to reveal to me, which is power for my side of the negotiation. So manage yourself first, be a great listener, master the delivery, three important aspects that I've learned in my life or death negotiations that you can use in business negotiations right here, right now to make you a stronger negotiator and more successful in your business. Fantastic, Scott. Thank you very much. You know, a round of applause to Scott. You know, I'm going, I am the only one All that can do it. The other people which are online may not be able to do it. It was an amazing discussion. Thank you very much, Scott. By the way, a quick reminder, you know, in case you want to strengthen your negotiation and how about joining us? Geneva, 27 and 27, Geneva, Switzerland, 27 and 28th of June. With Oxford Professor Owen Derbyshire, the academic director of the Oxford Program on Negotiation. That's something that uh, you may enjoy. So don't uh, miss this opportunity if negotiation is uh, at the core. Um, on our side, we will reconnect with you soon for another LinkedIn Live. Don't uh, miss the opportunity to connect with Scott on LinkedIn if you want to have more of what uh, he's doing in his activity. Thanks again for everybody that are joining either live for the people that are listening to this event recorded and uh, all the very best for you for the rest of the week. Take care, Scott. All the very best. Goodbye. Thank you.